Então, chamo o professor Todd Hederson, da Universidade de Chicago, para que componha a mesa. Convido também o professor Cláudio Chiquida, pesquisador e membro do IDERS, então, para presidir a, a mesa, agora que tratará sobre a análise econômica do direito societário nas Américas. E, para isso, também convido a ilustre professora Márcia Carla Ribeiro, para que componha a mesa, e nos brinde, então, com esta apresentação muito eh, oportuna em se tratando de desenvolvimento econômico. Professor Chiquida, muito obrigado. Só lembrando, aqueles que quiserem, rapidamente, teremos um, temos um café aqui no andar menos 2 ou B. Tá? Mas, dado adiantado, então, passo. Muito obrigado, professor. É uma honra lhe receber aqui. Em nome do IDERS e da VDE, agradecemos a todos. Obrigado. Obrigado. Um, bom... Em primeiro lugar, é, queria agradecer é, o convite, dizer que eu também estou aqui em nome do IDERS, né, embora um pouco mais distante, mais ao sul do, do Estado. É, bom dia a todos. Um, bom, vamos, para não perder muito tempo, né, depois dessa abertura sensacional aqui da BDE, é, vamos começar. Primeiro, algumas palavrinhas rápidas, já que é o décimo congresso da BDE. É, eu não me lembro quando que eu me juntei aqui a esses, esses congressos, acho que foi o segundo, né? O segundo congresso. Né? E é uma alegria muito grande estar aqui, né? é, assistindo, apresentando. Mas é a primeira vez que eu acho que eu estou presidindo uma mesa e espero que não tenha nenhum impeachment à minha presidência. Ah, bom. Deixa eu começar apresentando né, uh, os nossos palestrantes. Né? Uh, a professora Márcia Carla Pereira Ribeiro né, é professora titular de Direito Societário da PUC do Paraná, professora associada de Direito Empresarial da Federal do Paraná, né, pós-doutorando pela, pela FGV São Paulo e pela Faculdade de Direito da Universidade de Lisboa, é pesquisadora convidada da Universi Universidade de Montreal, eu não sei francês, uh, advogada e procuradora do Estado do Paraná, também foi presidente da nossa associação, também foi presidente e fundadora da ADEPAR, que é uma das associações regionais que a gente tem, né? e autora de vários livros, né? é, vou citar só alguns aqui, tá? coautora de curso avançado de direito comercial, que se encontra já na décima edição, Teoria Geral dos Contratos, Contratos Empresariais e Análise Econômica, segunda edição, organizador de dois livrinhos muito, muito bons de ler, que é o que é a análise econômica do direito, né? uma introdução, né? e, que já está na segunda edição, e um outro livrinho, né? complementar a este, que é a análise econômica do direito, justiça e desenvolvimento. Né? Ah, o professor Todd Henderson... Acho que o meu inglês não é muito bom, mas nós temos tradução simultânea? Não. não. Uh, professor Todd Henderson is a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. And I, I apologize, apologize in advance for my bad English. Okay, sorry. Uh, professor uh, is also a, visit, a visiting professor at the University of Bergen in Norway. Uh, well, is, <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are a lot uh, to say about uh, his, his uh, academic production, and um, also uh, in Portuguese, uh, o professor Todd Henderson tem aqui um capítulo no livro que até me pediu para lembrar, né, uh, que é o um livro do que vai ser lançado aqui daqui a pouco, né, com autógrafos, que é o Estudos sobre Negócios e Contratos, tá, a editora Almedina. É um livro que tem várias pessoas aqui da associação, né? organizado por dois membros da Associação Mineira de Direito e Economia, da qual eu fiz parte durante muito tempo, até me mudar para Pelotas. 
Né? É, então, o Ivan Guimarães Pompeu, que não se encontra presente, o Lucas Bento e a Renata Pompeu, que aqui está. Né? E a gente tem vários autores, eles estão, desculpa, listados aqui, né? Bruno Salama, Thomas Ullen, o professor Todd Henderson, Cláudia Cristófani, Gabriel Messina, Elisandro Haddad, é, Mariana Par, Pargendler, né? o Bruno Salama, Nuno Garoupa, então, assim, muita gente conhecida está no meio. Tá? É, então, acho que, para a gente não se atrasar muito, sem mais delongas, eu pensei em mais ou menos 30 minutos para cada um, 30 minutos, né, com, a gente deve ter umas plaquinhas de minutos aqui para tá, auxiliar no controle do tempo, é sempre um problema. Né? Eu mesmo estava precisando de uma plaquinha dessa, porque já estou falando muito. É, e aí a gente abre o final... Tá, é, para perguntas. Né? O nosso painel, esqueci de falar o nome, mas é tá aqui, né? a análise econômica do direito societário nas Américas. Eu deveria ter falado isso no início. Tá? Muito obrigado a todos. Né? É, acho que o professor Todd Henderson primeiro. Eu estou feliz de estar aqui. Deixe-me me apologize que eu não falo português. And so I appreciate you all listening in English. Uh, the fact that I don't speak Portuguese made listening to the judge more difficult. I did hear the word Petrobras, so I think I kind of understood what he was talking about. My article in the book is also a little bit about Petrobras. It's about minority investors and the protections for minority investors. Some of these minority investors were in the United States. And as you'll read in my book, I don't feel bad for them. They were investing in a state-run business. They knew what they were getting into. But minority investor protection generally is very important. And so that's what I was writing about in there. Today I want to talk about something else. Trust or confiance, con something, yes? Confiar, confiance, yes? And its importance. And my goal is to get, hopefully, to get you to think a little bit about regulation and government in a slightly different way. Uh, this isn't going to be about economics. Uh, there's no math. There are no numbers here. But law and economics is not really about math or about money. And it's not about predicting what the answers are. It's just a tool. It's a way of thinking about the world that might be helpful for solving some problems. So that's what I want to do about uh, regulation uh, and uh, the importance of trust. So really my question in this, uh, in this paper, and I'll go quickly because I, I'm uh, short of time, but where does trust come from? That's the sort of question. Trust is an essential part of human interaction We all can do more if we can cooperate with each other, but we can only cooperate with each other if we trust each other. And so what is the origin of trust? In my country, in the 1960s, when we had lots of hippies, do you know this term, hippies? Yes. People would travel around the country in search of their inner spirit or something. And they were too poor to have a car, and so they needed a ride to get to Berkeley, California. And so they would stand by the road and they would put out their thumb like this. And we call this hitchhiking. They're looking for a ride with a stranger. This is very dangerous. When you're a little baby, your parents tell you, do not ride with strangers. If you're playing at the park and someone comes up to you and says, I will give you a ride and I have candy, do not do it. This is something I learned very little. Do not ride with strangers. Only ride with people you trust. But this is a problem because today I was at the Novotel and I needed to get here and I don't know people with cars in Porto Alegre. So how could I get from there to here to make my life better, to be here with you today? Well, I had to trust a stranger. He was in this, 
a taxi cab. Now, why did I trust the person in this taxi cab? Well, the problem of riding with a stranger was solved by the government. The government said, we are going to have a group of people called taxi cab drivers. We're going to paint their cars a particular color. We're going to put a sign on the top that says taxi. There's going to be a meter so that you know when you are paying, you're paying a fair price. And these people are going to be regulated. The drivers have to have a particular license. The companies are regulated. They have to have insurance. You can trust Mr. American coming to Brazil to ride with a stranger. Government solving the trust problem. And that government action, the regulated action, allows people to cooperate. This makes everybody better off. So trust is absolutely essential to human progress. Economists have done research about trust, and more trustworthy societies are richer societies. And the reason they're richer societies is because trust enables exchange. It enables you to be a specialist. If I can trust that the food that I eat that is produced by people that I have never met is not going to poison me, then I don't have to spend my time making food. I can rely on them to make food. They specialize in food. I specialize in being a professor. We exchange services. This allows specialization. Specialization allows productivity increases. This is something Adam Smith talked about 200 years ago. And those productivity increases generate more wealth. And then, the more wealth we have, the more things we want to do, we want to cooperate even more, and that creates a kind of virtuous circle that is, uh, demands trust. In my country, if you read the newspaper, like in your country, if you read the newspaper about trust in government, it is collapsing. People are not very trusting of the government. This is a survey of people in the United States' trust in government from the 1960s to today, and you can see it's going down. Politics in my country, like your country, doesn't offer very much hope. Politicians are not very responsive to the people's demands. This is a car in my neighborhood that I took a picture of, and these are bumper stickers. Uh, we, I don't see these in Brazil, but in my country, people put stickers on their car with their favorite things. Luciano would have Gremio on his, on his car. It was a great win last night. Here is a, a car in Chicago, and you can see here, this is the bumper sticker for Hillary Clinton in the last presidential election. And right next to it is our baseball team, the Cubs who won the, we say world championship, but it's really just the American championship, <laughs> baseball team. Why am I showing you this picture? Because in my country, probably like in your country, voters do not influence elections. The average voter, when they go to vote, they have 0% chance of influencing the election. The marginal value of one vote is zero. So why do people vote? Well, when people vote, they don't influence the election, and therefore they don't get any gain or loss from that, but they do gain from being part of a team, being part of a tribe. I am a Clinton voter, and that means something to me. It's like rooting for a sports team. I'm a fan of Gremio, and everything that Gremio does is wonderful, or the Cubs. And being part of a political team is the same sort of process. You people vote because of a kind of tribal affiliation, not because they are going to change the policies of the country. So politics doesn't offer a lot of hope uh, for uh, creating trust. As a result, government just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Here's the U.S. government size from 1910 until 2010. And these colors are different spending pieces of government. 
And you can see one thing about this chart, it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And sometimes there have been Republican presidents and Congresses, and sometimes there's been Democrats, and there are no changes. There was a war here we fought in Europe, and there was a war here we fought in Europe, and other than that, it's just going up and up and up. Because people don't really pay attention to politics, they don't pay attention to the size of growth of government, and people rely on government to provide the trust, like the taxi cab. And like I said, in the taxi cab case, it was a very good thing that government did to regulate taxi cabs. I'll come back to that in a second. So trust seems like it's falling, but in a sense, trust has never been higher in human history. People on eBay, this is a, do you know eBay? Yes? They process, eBay processes 10,000 transactions every second. And there is no government in sight. I can go onto eBay, you could do it here on your phone, and buy something in China, and that thing will come to your house in Brazil, and there's no government involved. If you get cheated in that transaction, and you go to the Brazilian government, we can go to the judge right here and say, Your Honor, please help me. He was like, what can I do? I don't have any jurisdiction over the people in China. That money is gone. So why do you trust sending PayPal to someone in some village in China that you've never met? Why do you trust them? If you could go back in time and ask your ancestors, or just ask your grandparents, I'm going to wire 10,000 reals to some stranger in China, they would think you were crazy. But somehow the trust has been created that enables that transaction, and you're better off. You can get your Gremio jersey a lot cheaper from someone in China than you can from the store at the, at the, uh, at the game. Okay, so this is the new future of trust, these pl what I call platforms that enable cooperation and trust where there is no government. Okay, the general framework here is that trust is something that we demand as humans, just like we demand milk, shoes, light, everything that we consume or use in our world, we have a demand for, and there are people out there who are willing to supply it to us. I need to communicate with my wife back in the United States, Apple, will make me a phone. I need to trust that I can get a ride from the Novotel. Somebody will provide me with that trust. In this case, it was the, Brazil, the Brazilian government who regulates this taxi. So trust is, like everything, it's produced and supplied in a market, different suppliers of trust, and they compete with each other to offer trust at the lowest possible cost. So as in every market, People look for the most efficient provider of trust. Who can provide the trust I need to live my life at the lowest possible cost? Who are the people that provide trust, suppliers of trust? Well, first, mom and dad. Your family. They provide you with trust. You can rely on me when you're a baby. I will take care of you. And why, do I, why does the babies rely on it? It's just instinct. It's in our DNA. When we want to expand outside of the family to people who are strangers, we need other things for, to, to uh, create the trust. Religion could be this. I trust people who are Jewish because I am Jewish. I trust my group of people that I live with, my tribe, and I'm thinking prehistory, because they're in my tribe. I trust people who are in my country because the government stands ready to punish them if they cheat me. We could rely on our mom to drive us around. We could trust her. But it's way better when we can expand our opportunities and rely on other people to trust. OK. Some features of this market for trust. We can't really supply trust ourselves. We need other people to help us. It's very dependent on technology. 
It would have been extremely expensive to trust that person in China 20 years ago. But the internet allows us to have information, more information, and more information delivered quickly. So technology is very important. Before there was a written language, it was very difficult to trust people because you could not record facts about the world. Where is my property and where is your property? How many bushels of sugar cane did you promise to deliver to me six months ago? Ah, I have it right here on this piece of papyrus. Paper and language allows us to create more trust because it increases communication. Importantly, government, who is sort of the hero and the villain of my story, is both a provider of trust and a regulator of the market for trust. Government provides trust in the form of the taxicab regulation, but also government regulates people who would compete with government to be in the trust business. Uber is something I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. In my country, there were governments who tried to stop Uber. I see Uber is in Brazil, and I think that's wonderful, because Uber is the real hero of my story. <laughs> but if we were in France, and I'm glad we're not in France, because Brazil is the future, France is not the future. If we were in France, I'm getting some dirty looks and some good looks from that comment. If, if we were in France, there's no Uber. Why? Because the government has banned Uber. What's ironic about that is that Uber is offering a, compet a compet competitive, competitive service to the government. Uber came into France and said, uh, you know, you've got these yellow cabs and the government has provided trust so you could ride with a stranger. We have a better way of providing trust. The better way that we have to provide trust is an app. The app tells you your driver's name, his driver's license number. It's tracked by GPS. It gives you a rating system so you know your driver. The driver is not regulated by the government. It's not a color. There's no meter with a thing that's tamper-proof. But yet I get into Ubers all the time because Uber has said, use our platform and you can trust these drivers. The drivers do not work for Uber. Uber owns no cabs. It employs no drivers. It is offering a trust tool. And that is a direct competition with the government's trust tool, which is different, which is color, labels, ex-ante regulation, and they're competing with each other. So of course, governments can look at Uber and say, competitor. We have a monopoly on trust in the taxi business. We would like to kill our competitor. Okay. Different types of trust. I'll try to go quickly. Government. These are people, these little blue, this is us. We need to trust each other. What we do is we create this thing called government. Government is merely a tool for solving what economists call a collective action problem. All of us would like to act together. It's very costly even to get this room to cooperate. So we, we elect a few people. There are now fewer of them. The costs of cooperation are lower. And they can make decisions for us, like regulating taxis. The rule of law is the first move of government. When humans were hunter-gatherers and we lived in very small tribes, you didn't need any law because people behaved. If we went to Amazonia and we found the people of the Arrow, they don't have law. They don't have contract law. They don't have property law. They don't need it because their society, a very small society, operates entirely on kin-based trust. When agriculture was invented and human societies went from, uh, I have a picture of this, I think, my clickers. When human societies went from 
very small tribes of 50 people. In 8,000 BC, the biggest city in the world had 500 people. But 500 people is more than one tribe, and so we needed law. Some of those people were going to specialize in making clothes and some in growing food. And so this is when law starts. You can't have a tribe, according to sociologists, of more than 150 people. Once you get bigger than that, you need law. And if you're running a business like Luciano's law firm, if it's less than 150 people, you don't need a lot of bureaucracy. But if you get bigger than 150 people in your office, now you don't really know everybody, you need bureaucracy, and that's law. And Hammurabi, who wrote the first laws, wrote them because he needed people to cooperate. You guys are gonna farm, but you'll never plant seeds unless you can trust that when you pull them out of the ground, they'll still be yours. So law arises and it enables cooperation, and then very quickly, we go from 500 people to Tokyo, 30 million today, levels of cooperation that are impossible to imagine. We, we take this for granted, that you could go into a bar in Puerto Alegro and not worry that the person behind you is going to attack you. But this is a completely unique thing of the human species. Okay, I want to go back to my picture here. The regulatory state, the bureaucracy. In my country, we have all these agencies with many letters. We call them alphabet agencies. The Securities Exchange Commission, the Federal Aviation Administration, the Occupational Self Safety Health Administration. I could go on and on and on. All of these agencies are a kind of larger version of the rule of law. How does government operate? Violence. Government has a monopoly on violence. If you misbehave, the government can send the police, the police can take you to court and put you in jail. And that's how they, that's how they create trust, the threat of violence. What will they do if the taxi cab driver breaches their contract? They can take away that person's liberty. Another type of trust creation is through businesses. How do businesses create trust? Well, starting in around the 1950s in my country, businesses invented something called brand. Coca-Cola, McDonald's. These became national recognized symbols in my country. So if you were driving from New York to Los Angeles and you wanted a hamburger, you could go into a McDonald's on the side of the road and you could trust that that hamburger would be of a certain quality. I won't say good, I'll just say of a certain quality. You wouldn't be poisoned because McDonald's spent billions of dollars advertising and that advertising was like a bond that it put and said, look, we spent these billions of dollars creating this brand, that means you can trust us because if we poison you, that billions of dollars we spent on the brand will be just wasted. And the great thing about businesses being an intermediary of trust is that there are many businesses. There is only one government. You have a government, you're stuck with your government. It's not so good right now. We have a government, we're stuck with our government. It's not so good right now. We're, we're alike that way. Businesses compete, there's competition. So if you don't like McDonald's, you can go to Burger King. And the businesses compete with each other to provide a experience that will be trustworthy. This didn't start with brand, it started with guilds in Europe, where businesses were operating in places where there was no law. Some of the earliest corporations, as we think of them, from the 13th century, before Portugal existed, before Brazil existed, as we know it today, before my country existed, hundreds of years, there were merchants from England who wanted to sell wool from the sheep to people in Europe. 
they went to Belgium to a town called Antwerp. And they were trading with the locals. And they were all English merchants. They set up their shops. The problem was that one merchant might cheat. He might skimp a little bit on a contract with a local Belgian. And if he did that, it wouldn't just be a bad thing for him. It would have what economists call an externality. Other British merchants would be harmed by his cheating because the local Belgians would say, those English, you can't trust them. That tribe, you can't trust those guys. So all the merchants needed to come up with a regulation to prevent cheating, to create the trust that you Belgians can trust us. And the way that that had historically been provided from the time of Hammurabi was government. But what is the problem of British merchants in Belgium in 1200 relying on government to create the trust? There is no government. The king is back in England. He cannot project violence, which is the way he would regulate them, to Belgium. He would have to invade Belgium. He would have to know that the cheating was going on. It would take weeks for the information to get back to England. He would have to send soldiers to Belgium to arrest the cheaters and drag them back to England. This is impossible. So in the absence of government, the merchants said, we need to create our own law or trust. They created a company called the Merchants of the Staple that promulgated rules for behavior. And if you cheated, they would throw you out of the guild. Fast forward to 1700 in my country. There were some people who were trading in stocks and bonds in Manhattan. And the New York legislature, the government of the state of New York, passed a law that said brokerage is illegal. You cannot be a stockbroker. Why? Because you're not really doing anything. You're just sort of a, we say middleman, the person between. And that seems like it's not a very good thing. So we're going to make it illegal. This is colossally stupid. But what did the stockbrokers do? Did they, did they get out of the business? No. But people wouldn't be able to trust them because... If you were cheated by a broker, you could not go into court in New York because the business you were engaged in was not something the government recognized. So what did the brokers do when there was no law, no government to provide the trust they needed to create with their customers? They created this thing called the New York Stock Exchange. The New York Stock Exchange created a shadow government an alternative to regulation by the government and said, look, we will sell memberships. We will set a course of good behavior. If you behave, you can stay. Your customers will trust you because you're a member of the New York Stock Exchange. And if you cheat, you're out. And just like the law, except in the absence of government, it was a competition to government. The same way that Uber is. The same way that Uber is an innovation that is designed to provide better trust than government. The New York Stock Exchange did it for stockbrokers. The guilds did it for regulation of cotton merchants. Okay, and then that's this, this sort of last version, the platform, the other kind of trust, personal trust. Personal trust is the best kind of trust. Why is the personal trust the best kind of trust? Because what is missing from this column that is true in these columns? There's no intermediary. There's no business, because businesses can cheat. There's no government. Governments can cheat. Interpersonal trust, the trust you have in your friends, you're not relying on somebody who's standing between you and your friend, some agent who might cheat you. So personal trust has this virtue that we're just trusting each other. Of course, the problem with personal trust is how many people in your life can you trust? 
It's very costly to build personal relationships. Your friends, if you don't talk to them for many months or many years, uh, they don't become your friends for very they, they stop being your friends. So personal trust is very costly to build. I can trust McDonald's even if I've never been in a McDonald's in 10 years. But if Luciano and I don't talk for a long time, he may not continue to trust me. I don't know if he trusts me now, but assuming he does. Okay, so in time in history, in the kinds of trust we have, we started with tribes. That was a kind of trust innovation. And when I, what I'm talking about here are technologies. How, how, 10 minutes, perfect. I'm talking about technology, but it's not technology like the iPhone. It's a social technology. Law, just like language and writing, are social technologies. They help us cooperate with each other. And by cooperating, we can do more. As the agricultural age arose, we saw the rise of new kinds of trust. Law, guilds. The industrial age brought us new kinds of trust. It wasn't enough in my country in the Industrial Revolution to trust the rule of law. If you were dealing with a giant factory, all of a sudden, you were consuming products that were made many, many miles away from where you lived. If you consumed a product and it harmed you in 1900 in America, who would you sue? You might not even know who made the thing that you were using. In a very small community, you know who sold you something and you can go and sue them. And just breach of contract or tort law is enough. But in a world where things are made in Brazil and you're using them in the United States, you need something more. This is where the, regulated, the regulatory state comes in. Government says, we don't trust just ex post lawsuits. We have to regulate ex ante, the factories. We need to screen to make sure things are safe. And of course, that works, but it's very expensive. And it's subject to capture. Regulators have a lot of power. Re relying on those regulators without good information gives them opportunities to, well, you heard the judge's remarks. Brand is a nice addition. By creating brands, companies now can say, look, you don't need more government. We can provide the trust. Imagine that there was no corporate brands and you were driving across Brazil and there was no hamburger place that you could rely on. You would need a lot more government regulation. Governments would have to police restaurants much more aggressively. And then we're now in the fourth age of human history. We've found ourselves in the information age. And in the information age, the costs of processing information are so low that this personal kind of trust that we started with is something we can now use at large scales. So when I go on Uber, I'm not trusting Uber to rate cab drivers. I'm not trusting the government to rate cab drivers. Who am I trusting when I get an Uber in Porto Alegre? All of you. All of you who have said, this is a good driver or not a good driver. When I buy on eBay, I look for the star rating. Who am I trusting? All of you. eBay is not providing, they've given us the place, the forum where all of us can have a contribution to the world's trust. Okay, I'm about out of time, so let me, I'm gonna just skip way ahead here. Uh, I've covered a lot of this stuff. Um, I'm gonna, it's not gonna work, so I'm gonna close out this way. The trust is um, like everything in a, in a product life cycle. We start, you know, trust is increasing, different types of trust are increasing over time, and then they become mature. 
like a business grows and then becomes mature and then it's replaced by another business. This is the same dynamic that's happening in the market for trust. The rule of law can only get you so far. And of course, we rely on it today. It exists in the background, but it only gets you so far. We needed to have the regulatory state. Personal trust can only get you so far. The brand, can guild, could only work so much. There was a natural limit on how big guilds could be, and of course, guilds could cheat just like the government. The future portends the growth of this new kind of trust, the platform, as an alternative to government. So I started with how great taxis are and how taxis uh, created this trust. A quick story and then I'll finish. In my country in 1980, there was the election of Ronald Reagan and a change of the psychology of the country against regulation. And when this happened, 32 states deregulated their taxicab business. They recognized what economists had recognized since the 1950s, which is taxi regulation is very inefficient. By giving a monopoly to cab drivers, you have too few cabs. Customer service, terrible. Prices, too high. The regulators, the taxi commission, are subject to capture and political influence and bribery and, and influence peddling. And these, in the Journal of Law and Economics, there were dozens of articles pointing out how bad taxi cab regulation was. So all these states deregulated their taxi cab businesses. 10 years later, they all re-regulated. Why? Because the deregulation of the taxi cab business in 1980 was a disaster. There was no way that the taxi cab business could operate without regulation in the 1980s and 1990s. If you think about it, taxis are not like other products where you can search for them. If you're standing on the corner in Porto Alegre and you raise your hand and you say taxi, What's going to happen? Five cabs are going to come up, and then you could say, well, let me see, which one of these should I choose? No. It's very hard to have a competitive market in taxi cabs. So when these companies all, when these states all re-regulated, it was kind of a victory for government, but a victory that said, for this particular product or service, government is the most efficient provider of regulation. And then Uber comes along. And Uber creates this platform and says, we have a completely new way of giving you the trust you need. And Uber is as important as the invention of paper and law and language. Trust me. <laughs> it enabled you to have a new way of trust in the cab business, and it worked unlike the attempts to just get rid of the government in the 1980s. So the lesson of this story is twofold. First, we should not, uh, I, I think there is way too much regulation in the world, but too often critics of regulation look at regulation and they just say, we should get rid of all of it. And I think that's a mistake. There are things government can do for a variety of reasons as a regulator that are unique to it. It is the best regulator of some things. And the second thing is, but not everything, and it has real social costs from its ability to be manipulated and abused and just to be inefficient at doing regulation. So if you believe in a big government to help people, that's fine. Nothing I've said here is against the size of government. Take all the things that the government is doing, spending money in regulating areas where it is not the most efficient regulator, and Uber is just the tip of the iceberg, and take all that money and spend it somewhere else. Pass it out to poor people. Whatever you want to do with it, I don't care. Because this is really just about finding the way, the mechanism by which human trust and cooperation can be delivered 
to everybody at the lowest possible cost. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you.